Brothers, there's a pandemic sweeping across our society these days. There's a pandemic that's not entirely physical and yet it's not entirely psychological. It affects both the spirit and the body. Some have called it the noonday demon. Some have called it melancholy. Most of us call it depression. It is not something new. Today we're going to see if this disease has been with us since the time of David and the flight did it. Even those saints that we read about in the scripture. Let me pray. Father, Lord, you know my weakness, especially in this hour. Lord, your word, you promised in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. Lord, I ask that your strength to be manifest through me today. That these would indeed be your words, that this would be your voice that is heard, that my brothers would see you and not me. Lord, you are the one in me. You are the vine. I'm only a man. Your will be done. You be the glory, the honor, the dominion forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to the 42nd Psalm. Psalms 42. Psalms 42. And as you're turning there, allow me to give you just a little bit of background on this psalm. Psalm 42, as you are no doubt aware, begins what is called the second book of the Psalms. In the Holman Christian Standard Version of the Bible, this is entitled, Longing for God. Psalm 42 begins this book, focuses on longing for God. We believe this is a Davidic psalm. It is addressed choir director and sons of Korah. Now it began Psalm 42, verse 1. As a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, God. I thirst for you, God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night Oh, all day long, people say to me, where is your God? I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I walk with many, leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. Why am I so depressed? Why is this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise you, my Savior and my God. I am deeply depressed. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peace of Hermon, from Mount Mitzvah. Deep calls to deep in the roar of the waterfalls. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. The Lord will send his faithful love by the day. His song will be with me in the night. The prayer to the God of my life, I will say, to God in the rock, why have you forsaken me? Why must I go about in sorrow? Because of the enemy's oppression? My adversaries taunt me, as if crushing my bones, for all day long they say to me, where is it? Why am I so depressed? Why is this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise you, my Savior and my God. I want to walk back through this with you verse by verse. I want you to see the picture that the psalmist paints of what this looks like. Rather, the statistics tell me 
that in each of our ministries we are likely to encounter this and we are becoming more likely to encounter this each passing day. The pandemic continues to spread among our brethren, among the unbelievers amongst whom we will minister. But most disturbing of all is the statistic that says about 70% of us will wrestle with this new day demon. And we will find ourselves in the same place where the Father did as he writes his words. As a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? Again, the Psalms, the Psalmist paints this picture of thirst, severe, the kind of thirst that's experienced by this wild animal. Pray. I don't know if y'all are familiar with deer, but they're not very high up on the food chain. The language here suggests that this is probably a hind, a female deer. They really don't have much option when something comes after them except for to run, and so he's painting a picture of he's trying to get away from this, but he's just so exhausted and so dry. But it's not physical water that lacks. It's the nourishment of feeling God's presence. I don't know how we can fathom what it is like to know that God is still there with you, but yet you do not feel his presence in a way that nourishes your soul. How can we know this unless you've experienced it? The man wants college. He had come under a severe depression to the point where he no longer desired to live, to the point where two of his friends had a conversation that went like this, where the one said to the other, I have never known a man who hated life as much as this man does. And I am fearful very fearful that we will awake one morning and find him dead by his own hand. This friend said, you're right. He does hate life more than anyone I've ever known. But there's one thing he hates more, and because he hates that more, that will keep him alive. The first friend said, I don't think that's enough. Brothers, can you imagine being in a place where the only thing that's keeping you from ending your own life is hatred? I don't know if the psalmist was there, but I know that this can happen. I believe it starts when you stop feeling the effects of the presence of God in your life. Now we're talking about David. But what do we know about David? Well, we know when we look at the pattern of his life, it seems unlikely to me that David is feeling cut off from God because he is out of the word, and he is not praying, and he is not worshiping, and he is not fellowshiping. It seems unlikely to me that even in those days when he is on the run, which is when we suspect he is probably right as we've gone to run from Saul. He's hiding out in caves. It still seems unlikely to me that he's abandoned these spiritual disciplines. I think depression has the power to shatter our connection. Even when we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing, so insidious, is this disease. While we know that God is right there, it feels like he has gone far from us. 
My tears have been my food day and night. His tears have been his food, his sustenance, meals, day and night. There is no relief. Now, all day long, people say to me, where is your God? Where is your God? Where is he? Because it doesn't look like he's with you now. You're miserable. You're going around, you're crying. You're downcast. Everyone knows it. You can't hide this. Where is your God? I remember this as I pour out my heart how I walked with many leading the festive procession of the house of God with joyful and thankful shout. Do you hear what his answer is? All he can do in this moment is remember the time before he was cast down. All you have left is a memory. Because he can't feel the joy of God right now. He can't experience the thankfulness of God right now. He's been cut off. And so he goes back to the time when he was feeling the presence. Why am I so depressed? He doesn't know. I believe if you ask that man who hated life so much, I don't believe he could tell you why he hated life. I don't think he knew. I don't think there's a logical answer for why we go into depression. Sometimes there's an event we can point to, right? We know that Spurgeon struggled with depression. We know that that was started when a couple of people died in a very unfortunate incident in this church. But I'm willing to bet that we could get the man himself in here today. He would echo the words of the song. He would say, I don't know why I'm depressed. I know what triggered it, but I don't understand how that can cast me down here because I have the Lord with me. Why this turmoil within me? And then watch this refrain. Put your hope in God, for I will praise him. My Savior, my God, will see this again. I am deeply depressed. Therefore, I remember you in the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizra, deep calls to deep the roar of your waterfalls. Some translations will have this as cascades. So he's painting this picture here of these powerful rapids. And he feels like he is caught up in the middle of this, just swept along by the currents, being thrown against these rocks and then swept on downstream. And he's helpless to fight against this. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. Picture the ocean with the waves. And it picks you up and it casts you down into the trough and then it picks you up only for a moment and then you're back down the trough. And there's nothing you can do. The Lord will sing his faithful love by day. The song will be with me at night. A prayer comes. God of my life, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? He's having this question within him. Has God forgotten me? Has he forsaken me? Has he abandoned me? The attacks of the enemy.
there's a song that so beautifully captures the sentiment that I see here. It's called The Silence of God. It's by Andrew Peterson. Michael Card also does the cover. It talks about what it's like for us when we're crying out to God the way the psalmist is here, and there seems to be no answer. My adversaries taunt me as if crushing my bow. Of course they do. Because people are asking him where his God is. In this moment, it looks like the enemy is winning. Because they have so robbed this man of the joy that should be his in the Lord that people can't even tell if the Lord is with them anymore. And all day long, they say to me, Where is God? Why am I so depressed? Why is this turmoil with me? Brothers, you're going to hear that question. You're going to encounter people who are in this place, tossed about by the waves, swept up in the rapids of life, cast down and afflicted to the point where they don't have any joy. And they're going to come to you, the one who is the distributor of the word of God, the minister, and they're going to say to you, Why is this happening? Brothers, there's a very real possibility that you'll be the one. That you'll be the one cast down. That you'll be the one asking. And how do we respond? What do we tell them to do? I think the church has gotten this wrong a very long time. And because we had the wrong answer, people have gone other places. Because somewhere in the last few decades, the last hundred years or so, we've gotten this idea that we need to have a very superficial joy in the church, right? You come to church and you plaster on a smile. You pretend like everything's going great. Whatever problems you're having, you keep them away from where God is. People are dying. And where do we see this in the Bible? The shortest verse tells us that Jesus wept. If Jesus is weeping, why can't we? And Jesus isn't weeping tears of joy in that verse. He's weeping because his friend is dead. Weeping because something has gone wrong. He's weeping because of the effects of sin. But we lost that. And so now we send these people out who need God so desperately, who thirst for him like some animal on the verge of death, exhausted, death, like somebody who's hopelessly caught up in the vastness of the ocean being swept about by the wave. And we send them to godless psychologists who have nothing to offer except an easier road to hell. We expect them to plaster on a fake smile when they come to the place that has what they need. What do we tell them? We don't tell them to just take it off. We don't tell them to just pick themselves up and dust themselves off and get back in that saddle again. We don't come at them and say, well, you probably haven't been doing this, and you probably haven't been doing that. They can't take that in that moment. We've got to be gentle. I said, don't you see the kind of suffering they're enduring? And you would come after them with accusations? No. No. You want to look at their spiritual disciplines. You want to make sure they're doing what they need to get to God. You just got to come out and get them. You don't want to show them the contrary. 
right? So the version that Fauna told you about, it, it talks about how they walk and see all the people who are rejoicing in the happiness they got. It's just, it's just like taking a man who's dying of dehydration and putting him in the middle of a pool of fresh, potable water that he can't drink. Don't be so cruel. No, brother, this is a difficult situation. And when you find somebody here, when we find ourselves here, there's only one thing we can do. Look at this verse for you. Put your hope in God, for I will still praise Him, my Savior and my God. When we encounter this in the lives of our congregants, when we encounter this in our own lives, there's only one thing we can do, and that is to hold on to God for all that we're worth. The psalmist here is struggling. He is fighting to keep a hold of that hope he has. I don't think he feels it, but he knows that it's there. It's like a man who picks black midnight, holding on to the mast of a ship that is rocked by a terrible storm, and he can't see it. And his arms are so cold from the rain that he can't feel it, but he knows that it's there, and he is going to cling to that for the earth. encounter somebody there, all we can do is encourage them to hold on. When we're there ourselves, all we can do is hold on. But you know, that's the only thing we can do anyway. John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches, you abide in me, and I am him. He it is that bears much fruit, for without me you can do Nothing. And that whole chapter, as Vance Pittman so ably points out, there is not one command to bear fruit. What is the command? The command is to hold on to the vine. Because that's all we can do. It doesn't matter where we are. So if you find yourself in this darkness attacked by the noonday demon, do what you were doing before. Just keep doing it. And there's one other thing. Clinging to his Savior as God. Our Savior has many titles. There's a poster in my church I would like to take down. Because it has a lot of those titles, but it doesn't have my favorite one. The man of sorrow. The man of sorrow. When you find yourself here, remember that Jesus wept. Remember that he was in the garden alone. The great man of life. Remember that he was the man of all sorrow. And whatever you're going through, he has been there. When you feel like you are overwhelmed, he's been there. When you cannot feel the presence of God, he's been there. The man of all sorrows has never forgotten what sorrows are suffered by the soul that he bought. Let me pray for you. Father, Lord, I have known this darkness in my own life. I know the truth behind the word that's fallen asleep. Lord, I know that you also are aware of what this is like. You know our weakness. You know our susceptibility, Lord. Lord, you know that if we were left to our, to our own devices, we could never keep hold. Lord, we thank you that you have taken hold of us. That your grip will never be broken. Not by the waves, not by the rapids 
not by our weakness, not by the storm, not by the dark, not by all these faults of the garden. Lord, help us to remember it. Even in hard places. Even when our heart echoes Psalm 22. Lord, I ask all these things for the sake of your glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.